Hello and welcome back to AB 474 Indoor Environmental Control. Uh, we are in our section on heat transfer in building structures. Um, this is the second installment or the section, second part uh, which is uh, going to focus on convection. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, when we talk about convection we're talking about the mode of heat transfer uh, or the mode of energy transfer <clears throat> between a fluid and a surface. So if you recall, when we talked about uh, conduction heat transfer, it required two surfaces to be touching. Um, it could also be um, material within the same object that's touching. So essentially, the molecules have to be uh, touching one another. When we're talking about convection, we're talking about uh, energy transferring between the surface of an object and a fluid, such as air or water, that is next to that surface. It can be moving. It can be still. Um, but the transfer of <clears throat> energy uh, at the surface of, of two um, uh, two materials, one being a fluid and one being a solid <clears throat> on a surface, and so we should make note that that solid must be a solid surface. Um, in your book, it's equation, the governing equation is represented as equation 58A. And it is denoted as Q dot equals H A T minus T W or delta T, um, where H is referred to as the film coefficient. A is the area, and this is the area of the solid surface. <clears throat> T uh, right here is represented as the bulk temperature of our fluid. So it's the temperature of our fluid, and then Tw is the temperature of the surface and W here denotes wall so in our building they're assuming that we're looking at tra heat transfer uh, at a wall or a roof or a you know it's a, a part of the building structure so <clears throat> and if we want to look at this equation represented on a uh, so this is a total heat transfer basis um, if we want to look at it on a per unit area basis, then we look, say, essentially H delta T. Um, and in our book, um, to get some representation of um, these film coefficients, table 5, 2, A, and B um, are examples or our typical values that we're going to be looking at whenever we're looking at uh, convective heat transfer on the surface of one of our walls. Um, <coughs> we can also, so following on our last section which was on conduction and at the end we were representing our uh, heat transfer coefficients, our uh, thermal resistances uh, as uh, um, thermal circuits, we can create the analogous uh, representation for convection as well, which gives us lots of opportunities for beginning to combine the modes of heat transfer. <clears throat> and it looks very similar to what we did with our thermal resistance values, so our resistivity conductivity values. 
<coughs> and you can see where we're going with this. When we convert our film coefficients to an R, or a thermal resistance value, then we can begin to combine it with our conductive R. <coughs> Surface. <coughs> Two materials as we saw before, so we are going to have heat that is transferring through our wall and now we're going to add in so let's say for example <coughs> in this case this is outside inside and then two building materials that um, inside, that are forming our um, <coughs> that are forming our, our wall section and let's just say it's two materials. We have a resistance due to the convective uh, uh, activities outside. We have a resistance through this wall section, the portion of the wall section A, and a resistance through the portion B, and a resistance at the uh, surface of the inside. And when we look at the total heat transfer, it's the combination of the heat transfer due to convection and the heat transfer due to conduction. <clears throat> now if we want to break this down and begin to understand the amount of heat transfer um, due to conduction at the surface of these materials, let's take a look um, and talk about the types of convection. Um, so we have forced convection and free convection. Um, when we are thinking about heat transfer from a forced convection system, usually uh, within HVAC, we're going to be talking about a forced air system where we're blowing air actively. Um, and <clears throat> the heat transfer due to, convic due to convection is, uh, results from primarily from the motion of the fluid due to forced flow typically we have a well mixed flow field we can also um, uh, think of convection at like the outer surface of a building as forced convection where we're using wind or the wind is creating the, the forced flow um, free convection <clears throat> Typically when we are analyzing free convection inside a building, we're looking at things that happen like with a boiler system uh, where we may be delivering uh, hot water into a set of pipes that are acting as a, um, a heat exchanger into a room and uh, the there is no air being forced over those in order to transfer the heat into the room and so we also call this free convection natural convection <clears throat> and the motion so this is the motion of the fluid so the mixing of the fluid the movement of the fluid uh, is due to buoyancy primarily to buoyancy effects resulting from the fluid density differences. Um, we also discussed the essentially the at the surface of a wall inside of a building is primarily uh, free convection as opposed to forced convection. Um, 
So where we get our film coefficients. So we referred to table 52A, and that's for a wall section um, for either inside or outside of the building. Um, but we may have other instances where we want we are interested in convection, uh, such as um, with our duct system as we're delivering uh, conditioned air into a space. This is one of our primary um, opportunities for convection to have effects on our environmental control system. So um, let's spend a few minutes uh, looking at the, the film coefficient and where we get it. Um, and then we'll uh, look at some things that aren't in our textbook. Okay, so the film coefficient is also called unit surface conductance. <clears throat> or it's also called the convective heat transfer coefficient. So how do we get these values? So we already identified uh, a table in the text, and that table is appropriate for still air or outside air conditions with moving air. And that was table 5, 2, A and B, depending on which set of units you're working in. Um, for turbulent airflow, for example, inside a duct, and this recall is what we're uh, looking at when we're talking about forced air, um, there are equations in the reference that I provided for you from Albright. So that's on the wiki. <clears throat> we essentially have to calculate the uh, heat transfer coefficient for forced air inside of a duct. Um, as you can imagine, there are many, many other scenarios that we won't address in this class uh, that are relevant to HVAC as well as other applications. So for other situations you're going to go to other references uh, to get this uh, heat transfer coefficient, the convective heat transfer coefficient. Um, for HVAC applications the best place to start for that is in the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals. Um, <clears throat> But depending on your application and your scenario, there's lots of other references out there that you would be looking for. Um, for natural convection, specifically uh, for this class, we would be interested in uh, natural convection over the outside of um, plates or pipes. So one example of this is uh, heat loss as you're transferring your air uh, or, or a fluid uh, from one space to another space. Um, we are going to do a, an example with this in lab, uh, but we can look at Albright um, 3.2 for a reference to get the heat transfer coefficient in that scenario. Um, <clears throat> let's take a few minutes and uh, take a look at um, some of the uh, values that we're interested in with natural convection. So as I said, we're going to do a lab that uses this. So for the exam, I would never ask you to calculate uh, the film coefficient uh, for natural convection just because the process is long, but you are going to have to do it in a lab, so you'll experience it. Um, and I potentially might ask you some of the um, governing relationships about what's important and what factors into this heat transfer coefficient. Um, so we have a number of numbers that were um, very likely named after 
either successful graduate students or faculty members who fit equations in order to do this prediction of how uh, convection behaves. Um, and the first one we're going to look at is called the Nusselt number, uh, where the Nusselt number is equal to HL over K, where H is our convective heat transfer coefficient that we are looking at. <clears throat> L is called our characteristic length of the solid. K is our thermal conductivity. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to you will want to take a look at Albright Table 3.1. So again, this is a reference that I've posted for you on the course wiki. Specifically, um, page 6.4 discusses some properties related to um, the Nusselt number. Then we have the Prandtl number. is uh, mu c sub p over k, where uh, we're starting to bring in dynamic viscosity of our fluid. And the Prandtl number represents a ratio <clears throat> of the moment of diffusion to the conduction of diffusion. So it's beginning to relate the properties of that still air and how likely they are to diffuse, uh, uh, essentially begin to move into one another. And then we have the Grashof number. <clears throat> by far the scariest of the three in terms of, uh, oops, okay, so the Grashof number is G rho squared beta L cubed delta T over mu squared, and this beta is called the thermal coefficient of expansion. And for just a little bit. for laminar flow, so when we think of laminar flow, we're thinking um, nice, steady, straight line flow, so like this. You would calculate the Nusselt number as um, constant C times the Grashof Prandtl number raised to the 0.33. And for turbulent flow, which is flow that might have some eddies in the current, it's not nice necessarily straight line flow. Might have some straight line properties, so kind of in general going this direction, um, but might have some, some mixing to it. Um, it might be straight line in the middle, mixing at the edges, but either way, the turbulent flow is not this, it's kind of the opposite of the, the nice straight line flow. So the Nusselt number in turbulent conditions is this constant times the Grashof Prandtl to the 0 0.25. <coughs> if the fluid that you're working with is air, then the Grashof Prandtl number is equivalent to 10 raised to the 8th L cubed delta T if you're at standard conditions, standard temperature and pressure. 
kind of final note on natural convection, and this is more about introducing you to the terminologies as opposed to getting really deep into the derivation of equations. Um, if you want to read a little bit more, and you're going to want to read a little bit more about this process of getting the natural heat transfer coefficient, natural convection heat transfer coefficient, I'm going to direct you to that additional reference and specifically Table 3.2 in Albright, in the Albright reference. <clears throat> All right, let's say a few more words about <clears throat> um, getting the heat transfer coefficient, but let's take a look at forced convection. And we're going to look at the Reynolds number, which you should have seen before, I think. <clears throat> Where V is the velocity of our air, L is this characteristic length again, and U is viscosity. And I will say that in uh, HVAC conditions, usually um, we are encountering turbulent flow. Rarely do we have uh, purely laminar flow. <clears throat> and for turbulent flow, is the governing equation for the heat transfer coefficient, where uh, g is a value that we call the mass flux, and d is a, a variable called the hydraulic diameter. So we have these characteristic lengths and hydraulic diameters and you want to pay attention to the uh, specific way that those are calculated. And this uh, hydraulic diameter is 4 times the area divided by the perimeter. <coughs> so I think that um, introduces the majority of the introductory terminology that you need in order to um, work on the work with the, the convection uh, problems that we're going to do in this class. And the next thing that we're going to do is kind of work a, a quick example applying that, the basic governing equation of convective heat transfer. <clears throat> All right, so let me get this. So this is uh, the example. It's worked out for you in the uh, reference material that I gave you for Albright. But so this is an um, example that's in 3.7 that's in the text. And we are going to look at a horizontal heating pipe inside of a greenhouse. Uh, the pipe carries warm water, releases it into the greenhouse air by convective heat transfer. So essentially um, there's energy we're looking, we're interested in the energy that is being lost to the environment uh, but on the outside of that pipe. Uh, we have the diameter of the pipe, we have its surface temperature, we know that the um, uh, set point temperature of the air inside the greenhouse and the, assuming that it's being controlled with that, is at 20 degrees Celsius. So we want to calculate this surface convective heat transfer coefficient and we want to calculate the rate of convective heat loss into the environment. Um, so in this case that pipe is actually being used to heat the environment. Uh, so having that heat transfer is not viewed as a negative. So we could have a similar example where we would have uh, a heat that, or a, a pipe that's carrying, well let's say the pipe is carrying the fluid to the greenhouse and along the way uh, it's in another building so that pipe could be losing heat on the way to that building that we don't want it to lose and then once it gets into the greenhouse we do want it to lose the heat so that it warms the greenhouse. Um, so heat loss is not necessarily a, a bad thing, it depends on what we want to control it for. <coughs> All right, so let's take a look at this example. All right, this is 
As we identify our heat transfer mode, this is a convection problem. And we're given that we have a greenhouse. And then we're going to look at kind of a cross-sectional view of that greenhouse. And likely along the wall is where we're going to find this pipe that has fluid running through it. So again, this is a cross-section of it. So we have fluid going either in or out of the page. Um, <clears throat> the temperature of the air inside the greenhouse is 20 degrees C. And this pipe is 50 millimeters in diameter. And the fluid inside is 80 degrees Celsius, so we can, uh, we, we weren't told there's any insulation here, so the surface of our pipe is, um, should be the same as the, <clears throat> the fluid that's within it. Um, so 80 degrees Celsius, and if we want to formalize that assumption, let's go ahead and write it down, that the pipe surface temperature is constant at 80 degrees Celsius. Now this constant at 80 degrees Celsius truly is an assumption and we'll get into that with another example problem but for the introductory purposes of this example we're going to assume that the the fluid is the same temperature throughout the pipe. <clears throat> so we need to figure out what is our heat transfer coefficient and what is the heat transfer rate due to convection. Okay. Let's see. Um, so again, I'm not going to ask you to calculate this heat transfer coefficient on an exam. Uh, so if you had a problem like this one, I would uh, give you the heat transfer coefficient. Um, But if we go to the table 3.2 in the Albright reference, <coughs> we look for a horizontal cylinder, and we need to determine whether it's laminar or turbulent flow. And if we do the equation, this is using equation 334, we get 0.75 times 10 to the 6th, <clears throat> where this L is the diameter of the pipe, so make sure that you read the definitions of each variable. Um, and then this is our uh, greshoff crandall number, and based on that, we can determine that our flow is laminar. So then we have the equation 340, here, which gives us our equation to calculate the heat transfer coefficient based on <coughs> our scenario. And so we get that it's 7.8 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So again, this part right here, I would not ask you to do on the exam. But I can't promise you, you won't have to do it on a homework problem or a lab. Um, so now that we have our heat transfer coefficient, we can um, then use it to calculate our heat transfer rate. And if we do that, we we'll plug it in to our H delta T and get 470 watts per meter squared. <coughs> um, for each meter of pipe. So if you notice in this scenario, we aren't given uh, the length of the pipe throughout the greenhouse. We're just given the diameter of the pipe. So we can uh, report our answer in terms of surface area, but we have enough information about our pipe that we can give it in terms of length of pipe. Um, and so we can kind of go the next step. So the area, the surface area is going to be 2 pi times the <clears throat> radius of the pipe times the length of the pipe. So um, this is a different L than up here, so pay attention to variables. So this is the radius of the pipe and the length of the pipe, which is pi times the diameter times the length of the pipe. 
<coughs> and if we plug that in, it's 0.157 meters squared per meter of pipe. Um, so again, I stuck with the variable name that was given in the textbook, though I would have made that a little d, much like the little d here. Um, but there was a discrepancy there, just make sure you note it. Uh, and then if we want to uh, take our calculation from above and add in this, the area, we have 0.157 meters squared per meter length of pipe. And so, Uh, 74 watts per meter. So we have our heat transfer coefficient and we can have our heat transfer rate represented on a per area basis or on a per length of pipe basis. And so that concludes this introduction to convection, refresher on convection, and some of the applications within HVAC. The next section will be on radiation uh, with examples. Um, so come back soon.